you, Tony Nye, who's our Clinton County educator, and Rachel Cochran, who's a water quality associate for OSU Extension. And um, they're going to be fielding questions and uh, guiding our panel discussion. So thanks. Um, and Tony, I'll hand it over to you now. Okay, Mary, thank you. I'm Tony Nye, the Clinton County uh, A&R educator in Clinton County. As you can see, uh, we have three panelists today, Matt Falb from Wayne County, Les Seiler from Fulton County, and Nathan Brown from Highland County. Matt's background, he's a fourth generation uh, farmer uh, there in Wayne County, farming about 84 acres. They grow corn, hay, and small grains, and they are certified organic since 2011. They also have a cow-calf finish operation and all calves are fed on grass. Les is from Northwest Ohio there in Fulton County. He farms with his brother Jerry on 1,700 acres of corn, soybeans, wheat, malt barley, and alfalfa. They've been continuous no-till for 35 years and they've used cover crops the past 11. Nathan Brown's a first generation farmer in Highland County. He raises corn, soybeans, wheat, and they too have a cow-calf operation. He began using cover crops in 2012 uh, after he met the late Ed Winkle. Today, the operation's 100% cover cropped, 100% planted green. He's doing some trials on grazing cover crops with his cattle, as well as interseeding 60 inch corn. He has a wide variety of uh, soils there in Highland County. And he uh, too has a lot of uh, slopes to deal with there in the rolling grounds of Highland County. Uh, they also use some swine manure from a local uh, producer, Sal Barn there. And Nate is heavily involved in Ohio Farm Bureau and many of you know him through the Ohio No-Till Council. So with that, first question I wanna ask and we'll start less with you. What's your definition of soil health? Oh, what's my definition of soil health? Uh, I guess uh, something I seen flash across my iPad here was treat the soil like a living thing. That it, that's a really good one, whoever sent that. I think that's, that, that says a lot. I mean, uh, minimize disturbance, uh, keep it covered, uh, just take care of things. I mean, treat it like you treat yourself. I mean, nobody likes to be sick and um, we can accomplish a lot more if we're, we're healthy. And I think the soil's the same way. Okay, very good. How about you, Nathan? Soil health to me is is uh, giving or making sure that the soil has the ability to function the way that nature designed it. Uh, there's a plethora of, of living organisms and things in the, the soil that <clears throat> you know is, you know we're all going to talk about today. You know we want to keep those things alive and functioning, um, where we're we're cycling nutrients and and raising raising the best, healthiest crops that we can that's nutrient dense um, and that is that is profitable for not only me, um, but those soils will be profitable for the generations to come. How about you, Matt, from an organic side, how, how does it uh, differ or does it not differ in terms of how you look at soil health? Yeah, I would echo a lot of what Nathan and Les have already said. You know, I, I think you know, I think of it as the capacity of the soil to support plant growth. Um, you know, I, I grew up thinking or my I learned from my dad, you know, that the soil health includes the chemistry and the physical side. But, you know, something that's new or for on our journey in the last decade has been, you know, thinking about the biological part of soils. And last night I took I'm taking a pasture for profit course and they shared that there's uh, over four tons of living organisms within each acre of soil, which was, you know, really, um, you know, eye-opening for me, you know, to think about that much of, of or living organisms in each acre of soil. Okay, very good. So what um, uh, are some of your goals for soil health? Nathan, I'll start with you. What, what do you have, uh, since you've been starting a uh, just here in the last few years, what what's some of your goals that may differ less? Well, really, when I started out, it was more about erosion control, um, and since that point, you know, we've we've learned and and um, seen the benefits from our cover crops and stuff. And so, you know, really, our goal right now is to grow that herd of 
organisms underneath the soil um, and to try to regenerate our soils so that we are, um, again, being profitable um, and, and growing that, that soil for, for not only my farming operation, but hopefully the generations to come. Okay, Les, I'll turn to you. Uh, what are my goals for soil health? Uh, I guess uh, short term erosion control was the big thing that got us started and uh, improved the water quality. Um, everybody deserves good, a good source of drinking water or good water period. And uh, once you started learning about that, you started understanding a little bit how all this stuff was connected through the biological part of it, which, which is just fascinating to me how much how much uh, everything is tied together, the, the, the bees, the everything. I mean, it's just a, a, an incredible connection and uh, it's just important to take care of it all and, and think about the decision you're about to make. If you're gonna go apply something, do you really need it or what are gonna be the consequences of doing that? Whether it's a pass of tillage or anything you're gonna do or herbicide, we, we really need to rethink about that. To, to, to build the soil and uh, continue on with our building process. Okay, Matt, how about yourself? What, what goals do you have in your situation? Yeah, I think it starts with having a ground cover on our farm as long as much as long of the year and as much as possible. You know, I think that that contributes to, you know, some of what Les and Nathan have already said, you know, <clears throat> you know trying to um, you know, grow our own nutrients and, you know, from the organic side, you know, we can't rely on, we, we're, our synthetic inputs are restricted. So, you know, how can we grow our own nutrients? And then also weed control is an important component of organic operations. And so having ground cover helps suppress weeds, you know, throughout the season. Um, so yeah, that's what I would add. Okay, Matt, uh, I'll keep you on here. So uh, what made you decide to take the uh, direction that you took in implementing um, some soil health practices? Did you uh, jump right in to make those decisions or was it kind of a long-term uh, decision process for you? Um, you know, we, we started kind of uh, getting more interested in it in 2008 when we started transitioning the farm to organic uh, operations and had a three-year transition period. and. As I said, you know, we, we are restricted on, on the use of synthetic inputs, so we had to start figuring out how can we start growing our own nitrogen specifically for corn production. And so that led us to, you know, thinking about what legumes or what kind of cover crop we can incorporate in. We grew small grains uh, as a source of cat straw for our cattle. And so, you know, for us, that was a golden opportunity to, to integrate some cover crops in the fall as a spring plow down for corn. Um, and then, so that, that kind of got us started. And then as, you know, in the, around 2015, we started doing more grass finishing uh, of, with our cattle. And so cattle need high energy forage to, um, to, to uh, finish properly. And so, you know, using cover crops to extend the grazing season. Um, and then also to, you know, gave us an excellent uh, feed source for, for finishing cattle. So that's been a real benefit or asset to our operation, the cattle side. Okay, Les, did you jump in or did uh, it take you and your brother some time having been no tilling for several years prior to that? I would say from the beginning for us, it started out with erosion. I mean, so we, we tried to tackle some of those biggest issues with uh, waterways, filter strips, uh, subsurface drainage and uh, I, I spent five years trying to figure out how we was going to put cover crops into our operation, just trying to figure out how to do it. And uh, the easiest thing to, ex that I found was to put wheat back in and dabble with that a little bit and uh, then try and implement it across every, off, across the corn and soybean acres. And now we've got some hay, alfalfa hay and barley and some other stuff. And uh, it, it just helped the diversity of it. And that's the diversity is uh, very beneficial in a lot of ways too. Okay, very good. 
Nathan, I would call you aggressive in, in respect to many producers in Southwest Ohio. So I wouldn't really say that you took baby steps. You probably jumped in a little quicker than most. So uh, one of the things that uh, has intrigued me watching you is some of the different things you've tried. Uh, what practices are you trying to implement that you seem or, or you feel seem to be uh, working for you in terms of improving soil health? Really, we started out um, terminating our cover crops early. Um, I used to, I wanted to have everything brown by, you know, sprayed by the end of April every year. And, you know, I really got to thinking about the organic matter that I could possibly be growing if I left that go. And so about four years ago, we began to plant green. Um, we delayed our termination till after planting. Um, and that has really, for me, has been a game changer. Um, you know, the, the having that green mat there, you, you know, it's pretty scary the first time you take the planter to the field and you've got six foot tall cereal rye um, and hairy vetch and everything else that is wrapped up and tangled up. Um, but that really has allowed me, especially with these wetter springs that we've had the last couple of years to be able to get on ground that probably was a little heavy yet, but I think the, the root structure and the organic matter there at, in that planting zone has allowed me and has forgiven me, um, for the sins that I'm, I'm doing and, and really has opened up, you know, let me get in and plant sooner. I've had you know, some neighbors that have been pretty well long-term no-till and they've about ready to pull their hair out because they can't get the planters to the field and actually have um, brought iron back out to the fields just to try to get things to open up and dry out. And, you know, I, I've told them, I said, you know, you're going to regret that come fall. You know, you've been long-term no-till, you take tillage out there, uh, you're com you know, creating compaction and everything else. Why don't you try to put some covers out there and try to plant green? And that really has been my number one thing that I have have been really excited about. Okay, uh, Matt, how about you? What uh, what have you seen to improve uh, soil health uh, in terms of practices? I mean, Matt's disappeared. His computer forced shut down, and he'll be back as soon as he can. Okay. All right, well, let's uh, uh, look at a couple of the questions then, guys. Uh, question becomes, what crop or collection of crops become a sustainable rotation? Also like to know thoughts on the hemp crop as a new means of, of diversification. Les, I'll start with you. Somebody gives me an opportunity to grow hemp, I'll try it. <laughs> I mean, I'm open to, the, I'm open to trying anything. Um, I, I don't know anything about it. Um, to be honest, I mean, I know it, I know it's, we could do it around here. I'm sure. Um, uh, other, other crops, I guess, trying to establish a market. I don't know if we'd have 180 acres of alfalfa, if we didn't have a hay mill nearby that that's uh that's a good fit there. Um, I, I really like how they operate and come in and, and knock the crop off and get it out of there. Um, it, it's, uh, it's been a good, a good uh, relationship working with them guys. Uh, the barley, I hope we can continue to grow barley just because it's a nice fit where we're at up here. I don't think we're ever going to be able to double crop with wheat that with the We've had good success double cropping beans with uh, barley because it's earlier. And um, it's nice to have the barley and the alfalfa and the wheat. And I'm in the Western Lake Erie Basin. So we got some cover on our, on our land that way. And it's uh, a good way to knock off some acres and uh, spread the workload out. Definitely. What about your thoughts on that, Nate? Well, corn and soybeans is not a rotation. <laughs> Uh, and you know, uh, you you you're the monoculture. Um, 
you know, really you've got to figure out how to get small grains or other things into your rotation. So you know, we are looking at trying to do a, a corn, soybeans, wheat, um, and following the wheat, even though we are in the southern part of the state and you can double crop beans, um, I'm really seeing the value of being able to get a diverse cover crop established in you know, the end of July, first part of August, um, and then as much as possible trying to incorporate back in my livestock in, into grazing on that. And, uh, you know, there's opportunities out there for other things. Um, I have a, a good friend of mine down in that that they are, uh, you know, after they get their wheat off, they're planting sunflowers. Um, then they are they are inviting the public out and charging for people to take pictures. Um, you know, there's there's malt barley. There's you know lots of different things that you can do. You know, we're probably um, not in a very good area to to um, try very many different crops to grow as a crop. But if you could find a, somebody you know that's feeding livestock. Um, there may be some opportunities there where you could grow something different um, and have have an in market there. But as many crops as you can get back in, everybody nobody likes planting wheat or barley. You got to get the combine back out in you know June, and you know it's more workload. But um, the benefits that I see from being able to to get that cover crop established earlier in the year is is a great benefit. Okay. Matt, there was a question that came up that might fit you uh, um, in terms of, and it'll, I'll, I'll ask this to all of you, but someone wanted to know, um, in using cover crops, how do you feel it's increase, increased your soil health enough to reduce fertilizer inputs? And I would also add to how has that helped maybe improve weed control with less herbicide. So Matt, since you're organic and you have those challenges for what's available to you, I'll let you answer that first. We lose Matt again. Yep, must have lost Matt. So uh, Les, I, I know you talked uh, in uh, some questions and answers we've talked about uh, and looking at uh, reducing herbicides. So uh, how, how have you seen the utilization of cover crops helping you in that, in that manner? Well, something that we're, we're gonna focus on this year, we uh, went together with another farmer and we purchased a crimper roller. And we, uh, when we interceded our um, soybean acres last year, we bumped the rate of cereal rye that we had uh, sprinkled on. And we're hoping that we can utilize that crimper to maybe cut back on some uh, herbicides that way. Um, we've also, we've not, we've not spread, uh, I haven't planted a corn crop with phosphorus for four years now. And uh, I'm very happy with our corn yields and they, our soil tests don't seem to be showing that we're mining it. Um, and I just think we're, uh, we're seeing some things opening up some access to some, uh, nutrients that are in the soil that we're taking advantage of that way. And, and our soil tests seem to be, we're building instead of, uh, declining in any way. So I feel pretty good about that. Hey, okay, Nathan, how about yourself there in terms of uh, reducing herbicides maybe, or reducing your fertilizer use that you would have when you first began? Well, normally when I'm setting out to put a crop, cover crop out, one way that I try to figure out how to make that cover crop pay is by trying to reduce my chemical or my nutrient um, inputs. So, you know, the first thing I look at has been my chemical inputs. Um, if we're going to, to put out, you know, 15 or $20 worth of cover crop per acre, we would like to be able to reduce our inputs 
you know, at least that much, if not more. And really with the CRI, that has been a game changer in our soybeans. Uh, we have had times where we have done either skip the burn down or we have been able to skip our post applications because the fields were clean. Um, we have, and I have noticed this past year, water hemp has exploded all the way around me. Um, and so this previous fall, we actually bumped our typical rate of zero rye um, with anticipation of some water hemp uh, crossing the fences from our neighbors. And we're using that to try to manage water hemp. Um, like, so I, it's not on my side of the fence yet, but I know it's, it's going to be there. So, um, and nutrient wise, you know, I, being able to plant the diverse cover crops, especially after your wheat, you can really begin to grow some nitrogen. Um, I really, really got excited this past year um, after we cut the weed and I had my diverse cover crop out there and, and you know, had a lot of legumes in it. Um, we cut some of our, our nitrogen rates, you know, 80 or 90 pounds and, and uh, you know, was by far was the best corn crop that I've ever had. A question had flashed through on the chat regarding insects. Do you see uh, issues with uh, non-beneficial insects or are you having to change any practices in your in insect uh, pest control? I'll lead it to uh, Nathan and then go right into less on that. Really, we, we are seeing a, a decline in, in the, the negative pests that we have, but and we are uh, really starting to see an increase in our beneficials. Um, you know, I, I'm really surprised once you get different uh, species out there in the field, how they will attract different things. Um, and so, you know, we see an, uh, an increase in, in a lot of our um, ladybug populations we're seeing, you know, and we're just not seeing, you know, the insect pressure. And we are, we have pretty well taken out all of our insecticides over the last three or four years. And, and you know, if it, if we do have damage, we really evaluate um, what the damages would be um, beyond that, that pest that is causing the issue, you know, what is, what is long-term detrimental effect that, that that insecticide would have on the beneficials? Plus? Um, I got to echo kind of what Nathan just said there. I mean, we eliminated neonics on our, uh, our uh, soybeans when we get them treated. Um, we've uh, got a guy that's got some bees on our farm. And he could tell during the planting season, like he, we know this emission coming out of the air planters of, of the treated seed. He can tell he has a he has dead beans, bees laying around his hives. He's got a bunch of hives all around the area. And 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 there is a, an effect on that. So I mean, all that all that stuff uh, affects the things you need. Um, there's no doubt about it. We've got a lot more beneficial stuff on our land. Um, we don't use any insecticides at all. I mean, I, I put down two ounces of a, a tombstone in my in furrow on my corn seed because we've had some uh, um, issues up here in this lighter soils. And that's the only insecticide that we deal with at all. Um, and we've had some issues where I was told I should be spraying and we kind of watch things a little bit closer. We look at thresholds. And I think if you get into that situation, you need to spray. But to just uh, throw it in the tank because it's there, I don't agree with that. OK, there's lots of questions, guys, coming in about slugs, army worms, voles, uh, those kinds of things. Um, the naysayers to cover crops would uh, uh, bring these all to the forefront. So how do you uh, address that kind of concern? Uh, Les, I'll go into you first. I think we've all seen slugs out here. 
but I, I think it, it goes back to the last few years. We just haven't had any issues. Um, we've, we've been told we need to plan earlier and I, I want to plan as early as I can too, but we still need warmer soil temperatures so that we're not putting this seed in the refrigerator and uh, hoping it comes out in 20 or 30 days. We need to, we need to have quicker emergence. Maybe that means wait until the ground warms up a little bit. That's all, that's all better. Um, corn yield goes back to ear count and, uh, and we need, we need to have as many kernels out of the ground and putting ears on them as we can possibly get. And, uh, we seen in 2019, when we planted the first of June for us, we raised the best corn yields we ever had. And it, it all went back to corn or, uh, ear count. It was out in the ground and out of the ground in five to seven days and soybeans the same way. And I think sometimes when we plant too early, if we do get that cold rain, it's uh, a negative effect on it. And uh, the slugs do like that. We're also planting green. I don't know if that's kind of, we just haven't had a slug issue. We plant green and maybe, maybe they're uh, filling up on cereal rye or cover crop. I don't know. Nathan? Yeah, I'll echo that. That's, uh, you know, that's the number one thing that I have done that has decreased my slug and in insects has been planting green. Um, the last time I had a major slug issues, and tell, I'm telling you guys, they ate 50 acres or so beans off completely. Um, that year I went in and I sprayed early, um, when we were, you know, by the time the beans come out of the ground, everything was brown and my crop was, it was obliterated. Um, since that point, you know, we changed our, our thought process and our techniques and, and, um, have began planting green. Well, to plant green you know, I want as much growth as I possibly can get. So, um, not I, and not that we haven't really had the opportunities, but I still like to plant my corn, especially the second half of May um, after Mother's Day, and really in my part of the world, we've the last five or six years we've planted all of our crops Memorial Day weekend and after. So. Um, and I've raised 250, 260 bushel corn um, planting then. And so I do not have any issues with the late planting. I do like planting my, my uh, soybeans earlier if I possibly can because they grow with sunlight. And, you know, I like to get them established earlier, but I am not terminating my cover crop until later on. Um, so I think you know, having that green cover out there for, for the insects to eat on, but has saved them from eating on my crops. Okay, Nathan, this question is directly to you. Uh, you talked about increasing your rates of cereal rye. Uh, what, what are you looking at in terms of pounds per acre? And uh, has it posed any challenges early on in the season when you've gone to those higher rates? We started out, and you can get by with if you, especially if you don't have a, a high weed issue, um, you can get by with you know twenty five or thirty pounds of cereal rye. Um, you know you're looking at seven to ten dollars an acre in cereal rye. But if you have mare's tail, um, if you have water hemp, you know we're pushing that sixty five, seventy, even eighty pounds. Um, and some guys are going higher than that, but that, that rate there has been, um, most economical for me. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm shooting, you know, 70, right around that 70 pound mark. And, um, actually, you know, I do have a roller crimper that I use some to terminate and at those higher, higher rates, and that's still on the lower end for roll crimping, but. Um, I've got along really good with those kind of rates. Hi, Matt. I see you're back. Can you unmute? Yeah, uh, my computer decided to, uh, it needed an update and start restarting right in the middle of the session, of course, luck of the draw. 
Okay. So I have a question for you. Uh, what management practices have you seen uh, best improve soil health on your farm in your situation? Um, yeah, I think, you know, just having, having the cover crops, um, you know, and, and having, having that ground cover as much as possible. You know, we've seen soil organic matters increase about a half percent in the last decade. And, you know, that's is significant for water retention and uh, water holding capacity. Um, let's see what else. Uh, and also, you know, for us on the livestock side, you know, having practicing managed intensive grazing, you know, being careful about leaving how much, you know, enough plant growth after grazing and then also adequate rest period, you know, has really built up our soils. You know, I, I think, you know, our, our permanent pastures are, have the best soils on our farm you know, because of, you know, I think, and I'd attribute that to some of our managed intensive grazing practices. Um, and also it, they haven't been tilled in a long time as well. Um, and then just having a diversified crop rotation, you know, having, having it in a alfalfa grass mix for half the rotation. And then, um, you know, having growing small grains and corn, just, just mixing and mixing it together and then incorporating the covered crops. Um, we're also getting interested in integrating the, the the cattle grazing with the row crop rotation. So having dedicating one year of the crop rotation to cattle grazing, um, you know, I think is something that we're starting. You know, so I don't have a lot of data, but but I think it's there's some promising practices to it. One of the things that I hear in Southwest Ohio, unless I'm sure it can even be a little more challenging because you run a little bit later with your growing and harvest season sometimes on weekend, although it, it doesn't always work that way. But what what or how do you address trying to get cover crop in, especially after corn? In our case, we, uh, we use a high boy interseeder. Uh, uh, this year we did it September 8th in our soybeans and I waited till October eighth or something like that and we used an airplane on the corn this year because uh it was uh quite green in the september time frame we were we were blessed with a uh, really big rain august 8th or august 14th something like that and it took our withered up corn from the heat in july and and refreshed it and uh looked really good and it just didn't senesce enough that I felt we was going to get enough seed on the ground with flying it on earlier than that. So that's why we kind of delayed that. And uh, we ended up with a bushel on it. And uh, as we were shelling corn, there was a, there was a lot of rye growing out there. I don't like to get it out there too early because I've seen it growing in the corn plant. And I don't think after we harvest, we're going to get that to, that's going to amount to much for us. So I'd like to see that corn starting to senesce before we, Aerial seed it. Nate, a question for you. Uh, you talked uh, about, and I think even in your introduction about planting green, any major challenges with your setup with your planter for planting green? No, um, I run a Kinsey 3600 planter. Um, so I, you know, we took the no-till colders off several years ago. Um, we run um, the, the shark tooth style row cleaners on it. Um, the big thing that I see, especially planting corn into a, a cereal um, or a high, high carbon to nit nitrogen ratio um, is having nitrogen available on your planter. Uh, we have nitrogen in a two by two on our planter, um, you really need some nitrogen there close because, you know, a lot of guys, they say, well, you can't plant corn into a cereal rye because of the aleopathic effect. Well, I don't believe that there's an aleopathic effect on corn because corn is a larger seed. It, that aleopathic effect really affects, you know, your smaller seeds such as mayor's tail. Um, so, you know, guys, are seeing a nitrogen deficiency, I believe, more than they are an aleopathic effect. So getting nitrogen um, in a fairly reasonable 
area close to that seed of planting, I think is, is really critical. You know, I'm putting on 45 units or so just to get that corn up and, and to keep that going. And, and that's probably is the number one thing that I would say if guys want to plant into a cereal with corn is you need a good nitrogen source close to that seed. Okay, Mary's going to flash up CCA, but we're going to continue talking here uh, in that regard. Then um, looking at um, Matt uh, practices that you've utilized in the past, um, what helps you determine what practices you're going to continue with and they're worth repeating? I think, you know, having doing things incrementally. You know, we always, you know, the first time we try something, we have a, a treated part of the field and an untreated part of the field and, you know, make observations, you know, at planting throughout the growing season at harvest to try to decide whether it's worth repeating or, or expanding. Um, you know, I think about the first time, you know, we have, we use a soil uh, biology inoculant uh, at plant corn planting. And, you know, we, we wondered, is this really going to work the first time? Well, when we, you know, when we dug up the corn and looked at the root masses, um, you know, it, it was bigger in the part that we treated. So, you know, just just using that, you know, observations to to really decide what, you know, how you're going to proceed and what what you're going to do instead of just jumping all in, um, I think has worked for us. Uh, Les, how about you? What uh, what's uh, making it worth repeating out in your area? I think just overall improvement in soil health uh, uh, crop yields are, are very good um, I don't really get too excited about farming for the best yield around I want to farm for profit um, and, and I think we've done a we've been very fortunate to be able to do well there and, and in a lot of cases I think we have some of the better yields around so I think I think there's a the healthy soil thing goes a long ways with the healthy crop and uh, there's a lot of good things about it. I like this question next and I'll ask all three of you and we'll start with Nathan. Um, and it, it comes kind of because we hear people not always wanting to do cover crops. Um, so what other ways are there uh, or what other options are there to improve soil health? Nate, I'll start with you. What other options outside of cover crops to yes. to improve soil health? Really, you need to, uh, you know, if guys are doing tillage, you know, you, you really need to look at trying to um, limit your disturbance as much as possible. Um, and not only with iron, but, you know, also chemical and fertilizer, you know, Sometimes we're over fertilizing or over over spraying, and and you know that can have a real detrimental effect on on your um, on your soil health. Um, you know, just the biggest thing I think with soil health is try to mimic nature as as much as possible. And and when so, you know, I'm sitting here looking out the window, and I look at the trees that you know across the field there, and and there's not just one block of oak trees or one block of elm trees they're mixed in and out so you know really trying to diversify your um rotations as much as possible is, is a really is a key to soil health you know and again as like i said earlier corn and soybeans is not really a rotation so that would be a couple of my ideas matt how about you i'd, I'd echo a lot of what what nathan said you know trying to uh, avoid some of the, the synthetic inputs from, you know, from our organic perspective um, and, you know, having a diverse crop rotation, I think always helps. Les? I think the guys with livestock have the complete system. I mean, we don't have livestock, so I'm trying to make, make uh, things happen through the cover crops. And I'm not sure that we're using the right cover crops. I mean, we're using we've got a couple choices after corn and soybeans and that's basically cereal rye or annual rye. And uh, I still don't know that that's the right choice. Maybe, maybe we're, we're uh, hopefully we get, we get people involved in this and we can learn what choices or what crops we could bring some new stuff to the table that would be more beneficial. 
I feel like keeping a living plant in the soil as much as you can throughout the year is important. Um, farming is all about harvesting sunlight. And uh, if we can uh, keep harv harvesting it through the colder temperatures, I, I think, uh, I know the cereal rye in my area is growing um, in the ground. I haven't seen much on top, but I, I dug up some plants already. And, and that living root is uh, just really important. So another question uh, we posed to the three of you before this event, what is the biggest constraint to implementing soil health? Uh, is it knowledge, experience, economics? Uh, Les, I'll let you start. I think the knowledge. I mean, 10 years ago, we never talked much about the biological thing going on. And, and in, we have learned a lot there. We've We've learned how everything is connected, whether it's uh, insects or plants, and, and it's uh, important. Uh, we learned that we need to keep this living root in the soil to see improvement. Um, we had no-tilled for a long time, and uh, we strip-tilled, and we just we just never never seen the advances in uh, organic matter and uh, the improvement of the soils until we started mixing cover crops in. And it's trying to figure out how to how to uh, get them worked into your system, you know, with your management. A lot of management. Matt, how about you? Yeah, from from the kind of the organic perspective again, you know, I I do more tillage, um, you know, and, and out of necessity for weed control, you know, I have to cultivate my corn, and make extra passes over fields, and you know, I think that disturbs the microbial life in the soil and. So, you know, I'd, I'd like to do more no-till with, with uh, in my corn production, but it's, you know, I'd, I'm interested in the roller crimper and I'd be interested in hearing more of Nathan's experiences, but, you know, getting, doing more of no-till would be, would helpful, be helpful. Um, and then, you know, I think a, a timing is a challenge. You know, August is actually one of my busiest months of the year. You know, we're, we're harvesting third cutting hay, we're, wrapping up our small grain harvest, baling straw, and then trying to get cover crops in the ground after the small grains in August. So it's, you know, it's a lot to manage and a lot to juggle. So that's, that's a challenge. Nathan? I think mindset is the biggest challenge to getting cover crops to work. Um, you know, if we look at the way we farm today, um, and really we've not been farming we've not been farming the way we farm today very long you know really after world war ii you know is when everybody came back from the war and really when the agriculture revolution really started and and we started plowing fence row to fence row and and you know we look at some of the some of the obstacles we have now you know look at the western lake erie basin look at the gulf of mexico you know we think that we're doing right but um, you know, there's, there's issues out there that, you know, and I'm not saying we are 100% the cause of those issues, but we are, we are a part of the issue and we can be a part of the solution. So trying to get around those mindset of this is the way we've always done it. This is the way grandpa started. This is the way dad did it. This is the way I'm going to do it. Um, really is, really is detrimental to the, the incorporation of cover crops because, you know, again, cover crops may pay you back the very first year, but it may take you four or five years before you start seeing the return from that. But I believe going forward after that, you start seeing that return, um, you know, the, the, the repayment to, to cover crops and soil health will, will make you abundantly rich on your farm. Okay. Uh, another question then, uh, uh, we've talked about soil health. How do you know you're improving soil health? What are you doing to measure soil health to know that you're actually improving it? Les? Oh, go look at the living crop. I mean, take a look at your living crop, I guess, when it's out there. I think that's a good way to look at it. I mean, uh, in, in what you're, what you're uh, harvesting, I guess. Uh, creating creating a soil that uh, aggregate stability, um, you're not running running off uh, water, 
you're soaking it into the land. I mean, that, that we've seen is a really, really important thing. We're kind of dry up here right now. And uh, we've got drainage outlets that haven't run water since uh, um, probably August, September. We had a few little rains, but we're soaking, we're, we're capable of soaking more water into the land. And I think that's a really cool thing. You know, we can, we could take care of a lot of problems out here on the landscape if we could implement this on a larger scale. Okay, Matt. Yeah, I think, you know, one thing's first things we look at a soil test is the organic matter and use that as a, as a marker for, for improving soil health. You know, and we've seen, you know, a half inch or I mean a half percent, um, increase in our, since we've started being more serious about integrating co uh, cover crops into our uh, rotations. Um, you know, and also, you know, I think too, uh, we, we also see during tillage, you know, the tilth of the soil. And, you know, my dad always says, you know, after a cover crop plowing it, it's the, it's the easiest plowing soil he's, he's experienced. Um, so, you know, mm -hmm. using that as a, as a measure, you know, as, a, as another way we look at it. Hey, Nathan. I like to keep a shovel in my truck at all times. Um, there's nothing better than getting out and getting down your hands and knees and digging in the soil and looking and seeing what's there. Um, looking at the earthworm populations, you know, looking at looking at the the soil or the roots that are in the soil. Um, really, to me, is is the way that I know that I'm, I'm making a difference in the soil health and, and, you know, even digging through cow pies, you know, I had where I grazed my livestock out on my, my uh, cover crops last fall. Then I went out this spring and, and, you know, I, I found a, a pretty nice cow pie and I kind of flipped it over and kind of dug through it. And it was amazing to see the amount of worms that were, around that area compared to a bare spot, you know, that didn't have any covers on it throughout the season. Um, and one way that I tell you guys, um, an easy way for you guys to do a, a simple soil test or soil health test at home is to go out and buy you some 100% cotton underwear, um, take them out and bury them in your fields. Um, maybe, Maybe you've got a place that, you know, where you've had lots of livestock or, you know, places where you've had cover crops and then bury some um, even in the fence row and then go across the fence into the neighbors, you know, that may be conventional till and, you know, let that out there for, you know, 45, 50 days and go out there and dig them up. And it's amazing to see the difference um, in soil health. I mean, the amount of, amount of activity, you know, my cover crops and I even did it I had a plot last year where I had did it between different species of cover crops and it was diff amazing to see the difference even with cover crops how much more um, activity or breakdown you would have with those cotton underwear um, on one cover crop compared to another so that's a really easy at home test that you guys can do to, to gauge your soil health. Okay we're gonna have to uh, conclude here I want to thank our panelists uh, Nate and Les and uh, uh, Matt. So with that, um, 